Hello and welcome to another video. Um, I hope that you're ready for some fabric themed adventures because this video is going to be all about fabric shopping. So for a bit of context, all the way back in April, my wonderful godmother Arlene, who is an amazing seamstress by the way, um, gave me a fabric voucher for stone fabrics and it's in a golden envelope. I am, that makes me so happy. I feel like Charlie in the chocolate factory. It also has a little fa fabric periodic table on it. How cool is that? Um, but she gave me a fabric voucher as a birthday present and not only was this incredibly kind of her but it's also incredibly exciting because there's one thing that I love, it is a haberdashery. So I hope you enjoyed the video and here we go! So unfortunately the actual shop in Devon is currently closed due to the pandemic but it's okay because Stone Fabrics offer an online swatch service so I can get little snippets of joy sent directly to my door instead. And of course the first dilemma is deciding what to actually make because of all this choice it was a slightly daunting decision but I narrowed it down based on the patterns I have available, um, the inspiration that I was feeling, and lastly, the season that I would be wearing whatever project I make um, it will be in. So some patterns which I have available already, which I would like to use. Um, so some of my options would be, firstly, a Chanel jacket, secondly, a vintage summer dress, and thirdly, a 1930s blouse. At some point, I'd also like to make a corset, a jumpsuit, a 50s style um, dressing gown, a cardigan, a kimono style jacket, some high-waisted flared trousers and a waistcoat but I don't have the patterns for these at the moment so they shall have to wait for another time. So then on to the inspiration that I decided to go for. Um, I decided that my theme would be literary heroines because as a student of both Spanish and English literature I thought that this would be a really fun challenge and also a chance to kind of bring to life some of the ideas from the amazing outfits that I've read about. So, partly for copyright reasons, I've decided to go for more classical heroines, but I also think these are some of the most like interesting like style influences anyway, so I'm not too sad about that. So, the first figure that I did some research into was um, William Shakespeare's Titania, and also Peas Blossom, Cobweb, Mustard Seed and Moth from A Midsummer Night's Dream. So, we're starting out in the Elizabethan era, and kicking things off with some fairy folk, because I love this play. I oh, know I won't stop obsessing over how cool it would have been to see us in Shakespeare's time because you can imagine being like a groundling in the globe and the atmosphere and also the bubonic plague because clearly pandemic diseases love us but no we're not here to talk about that. So set in the outskirts of Athens, Titania the Queen of the Fairies is described as being a gracious and beautiful ruler. Um, between the escapades concerning two young human couples who've entered the woods, um, Oberon, who is the king of the fairies, describes Titania on one occasion as slumbering by a bank where the wild time blows, where ox lips and a nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. So the fairies, her servants, also have these gorgeous names, so like Peace Blossom and um, Cobweb and all of those but it kind of leaves a lot to the imagination and that's something I really love about the fact that it's a play since there's not really much in a way of physical description because it's it's like a lot of dialogue so there's this kind of fanciful whimsical quality that they have um, which is really captured in some of the stagings and the older illustrations so that's what I'm going to be using for illustration uh, for inspiration here um, I also like the fact that the fairies seem very at home in nature and a whole kind of organic and botanical references to their names so it feels like an opportunity to get some floral ideas in there hopefully and the next fairy tale character I'll be turning to is the Grimm Brothers Briar Rose from The Sleeping Beauty. So I don't know about you, but I think my first introduction to this particular legend was via the 1959 film. And just to say, I'm absolutely in love with the animation style because it's gorgeous. And the song Once Upon a Dream is definitely one of my all time favourites. However, my first thoughts for outfit inspiration here was actually Maleficent who I incidentally dressed as for Halloween. So imagine my shock when I found out she doesn't actually feature in the original story, or at least not with that name. So I think that she, Maleficent, was first introduced in the Disney film version. So sadly, I must abandon my hopes of iconic horns and dramatic black capes for the time being. But instead, I'll be looking at Briar Rose, whose name I also love. And as far as I can tell, in the original story, her name comes from the fact that when she fell into her like sleep of 100 years, Briar thorns, um, briar roses with thorns grew up all around the castle where she was resting. So she was a wonderfully beautiful princess and when at last she woke, she was free to enjoy all the gifts which had been bestowed on her at her birth. So I'll be looking at some really like opulent fabrics here, inspired by the things like the fairy gifts of um, things like beauty, virtue and riches. Right, so next we have Edgar Allan Poe's Annabelle Lee. Um, so moving on to some more gothic literature, we're now looking at a slightly more tragic figure because this poem describes the death of a beautiful young woman. 
So Annabelle Lee is definitely one of my favourite um, slash nostalgic poems because it used to be in this poetry book that I got from my parents when I was little. Um, but the poem also has this really haunting rhyme scheme and kind of lilting refrain, which I like a lot. So the speaker describes Annabelle Lee as a maiden with bright eyes who lives in a kingdom by the sea. But she's so beautiful that even the angels envy her and in a jealous rage they send a chilling wind from a cloud to kill her. Um, leaving her lover only to mourn her sepulchre by the sea. And this dramatic kind of gothic imagery is making me think uh, something gauzy and possibly kind of spirit-like for the fabric, but also quite fluid and floaty because of the strong reference to water and the sea throughout the poem. And in another story of kind of dark magic, the next characters I wanted to look at were Christina Rossetti's Laura and Lizzie from Goblin Market. So this is a poem about two sisters who attempted with fruit by wicked goblin merchants and it's basically a really interesting allegory about female virtue and the loss of purity, especially given the very literal context of forbidden fruit. Um, so in the end, Lizzie and Laura save each other from the evil effects of the fruit through the power of sisterly love. But what I find so interesting about this poem is like the incredibly rich soundscape of the language. Um, for example, this is an extract from the first part of the poem. Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plump unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheeked peaches, swart headed mulberries, wild free brown cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries. So the poem kind of continues in this really, oh, it's such a good poem. But um, yeah, anyway, as one of the pre Raphaelites, Rosetti's poem also draws on some of the fairly typical beauty ideals for women at the time. So the sisters are described as kind of pale and delicate with this go glossy golden hair. So I'm going to try and take inspiration from this and all the imagery of fruit and the forest in my fabric selection. Next, we have two of the most iconic literary heroines ever. And these are, of course, Lewis Carroll's Alice and the Queen of Hearts from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So I really need to read the original of this because every time I see it in Waterstones, I am without fail tempted. And the illustrations are like really, oh, they're really whimsical and dare I say it, like even a little bit ugly, but it creates such a like charming overall effect. Um, so in the books, Alice is described as loving and gentle and is of course depicted with this billowy summer dress and the apron. So I might look into some like kind of summery pastels for fabric in keeping with that theme. Um, the Queen of Hearts is even more curious as she's portrayed as this kind of small but mighty, almost comically commanding figure. Um, but in the original book, she is um, called a blind fury. So I'm going to try and reinterpret that through fabric choice of anything in bold colours or perhaps a particularly striking print. And now that we're done with Wonderland, the final figure that I'm looking at is Alfred Noyes Bess from the poem The Highwayman. Um, this is another poem that feels very nostalgic to me, not least because we had to study it in year five, but it's also the inspiration behind a music video for Fleetwood Mac's song Everywhere. So there you go, fun pop culture fact for you. The original poem has this mesmerising rhythm to it that kind of echoes the hoofbeats of the highwayman riding, riding, um, up to the old indoor. But I'm focusing here on Bess, um, the landlord's daughter, because she is, of course, the tragic heroine of the story. So after her forbidden romance with the highwayman is found out, she is captured by the armies like bait to lure him in. But rather than let him be shot, she kills herself with a musket and warns her lover with her death of the threat that awaits him. So in the poem, she's described as the landlord's red-lipped daughter, who is found um, plaiting a dark cradle of knot into her long black hair. So it's such a, like, a vivid description, I think that anything really um, lush and sumptuous would be a fitting choice of fabric for the inspiration here. Right, so that concludes the literary list for my outfit inspiration. I realise that I've gone for a kind of unintentionally mythological slash ethereal kind of theme here, but I think that any opportunity to make life a little bit more magical should be taken, so here we are. And I think this happened because a lot of the characters I picked were either from medieval legends, Elizabethan era pre-Raphaelites, or the Romantic period, but either way we've got some interesting inspiration to work with. Um, finally, in terms of the season for this outfit, I think I'm going to go for something that's not too summery just because I'll probably want to be wearing it towards the start of autumn. So that rules out probably really lightweight floaty fabrics a little bit, but I think what I'm going to do now is just have a browse on the website and see what takes my fancy for some fabric swatches. These are the swatches I went for in the end. First of all, we have this vintage cotton velvet in the shade Donkey Brown. Um, and you can see it's got a really soft nap, it has a lovely pile, so when you brush it this way and that is a slightly different shade than the light. But it was a little bit darker than I was expecting, it felt a little bit heavy for the kind of jacket I'd been interested in making. So I decided not to choose this one. Next was this really sumptuous glitter encrusted silk velvet, which is inspired by the magic from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Especially as the background colour is this lovely rich brown anyway, so it kind of fits the whole forest colour palette. 
However, I have mixed feelings about using silk because of the way silkworms are treated in some cases. So while I was curious to see what this fabric was like in real life, I decided not to go for this one either in the end. So that meant that I moved on to some of the fabrics I was considering for the summer dress option. So first of all was this beautiful broidery on glaze. Um, this fabric choice was inspired by the Rosetti Poem Goblin Market because for me the vivid colours and botanical prints seemed quite evocative of like rich vibrant fruit. But um, since the pattern was a bit larger in real life than I was expecting um, and it didn't quite drape the way I'd anticipated, I decided to uh, move on to the next fabric, um, which is this lovely tensile jersey. So again, this is reminiscent of a kind of foresty kind of colour palette with the striking orange tones really standing out like apricots or nectarines maybe. And I did really love this fabric, but unfortunately it was quite low in stock when I inquired about ordering it. So there wouldn't have been enough for me to make a whole dress. Um, so I looked at a different kind of tensile fabric, which was this deep emerald green. Um, this time it was a woven linen kind of feel, so it was a lot crisper and less drapey than the jersey. Um, but I still really liked it, and the reason that I was quite keen to go for tensile was that this fabric uses a closed loop process, so no chemicals are leaching out into the environment, and it's also made from sustainably sourced wood, unlike some types of rail and viscose, which are a lot more harmful to the environment. Finally, the last fabrics I had a look at for the 1930s blouse option I was considering um, were these uh, these really lacy ones that you can see because they both gave me kind of Sleeping Beauty and Annabelle Lee sort of vibes. Um, but whilst I really liked both the colour and the pattern of these, I decided I wanted to make a dress um, rather than a blouse at this moment in time. And having assessed the options, the fabric that I decided to go for in the end was this one. So it's a brown and black spotted tensile shirting fabric and I will be making a day dress inspired by Alice in Wonderland with it. So this is the fabric after I've washed it and dried it. And as you can see, it hangs really nicely. I'm really happy with it. So yeah, hopefully I'll have a new dress very soon and I hope that you'll stick around to see how that goes. So yeah, see you soon!